Future is a weird word with food. And if you say it enough times, it becomes an intellectual sedative. Um, it, it's a super strange thing that happens with food. Um, when people start to get TED talky uh, about food, there's this like sense of like hang the mission accomplished banner. We thought we're done. Um, I would love to dig into some specifics about how food is going to work. Um, none of those specifics will involve me telling you what the future of food is definitely going to be. Um, I was at a conference where there was this like grand unveil of um, two prestigious institutions' best prognostication about what the future of food would look like. And it, there was all this fanfare and all these different people coming up and speaking. And it culminated in a pretty lengthy discussion about the salad bar of the future. I was like, all right, we're going to still be doing that. Um, so if, if nothing else, um, my expertise is not in consumer behavior. My expertise is not in nutrition. My expertise is in how food does food stuff, how food becomes delicious, and then what we can do to present it to people in a way that meets whatever their nutritional expectations are, whatever their consumer experience expectations are. And based on that, we are going to need flexibility, the likes of which we have never seen before. Because I don't think I nor anybody else that's going to come on this stage is going to be able to tell you if we're only going to be able to eat algae by 2040, or whether crickets are finally going to happen, or um, what legislation is going to change, uh, whether or not we are allowed to continue putting CBD into everything from coffee to gummy bears. Um, what, what, I, what I would love to focus on is a set of rules and a set of ideas that will dictate how we respond to whatever that stuff is that happens. Sound good? Cool. This is a blood orange. Um, it's a pretty picture, and it terrifies me. Um, when, we, when we look at food as just like inspirational backdrops, it gets really, really easy to divorce ourselves from what it actually is and the rules that it plays by. So I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about this. Um, this is the way that we interact with food right now. We look at meat, popcorn, brulee onion, and we talk about what we're doing to it, what it does for us. Um, that latest issue of Eating Well had a bunch of really great recipes where you talk about all the ingredients you need, all, all the stuff that you need to put together. Um, all of these ingredients are one level of abstraction higher than my partners and I on our day-to-day think about food. Um, if we go one level of abstraction deeper and we think about the true ingredients, this is them. So I wrote a book. It's called Ingredient. It's an instant classic. Check it out wherever good books are sold. Um, <clears throat> the premise of this book and the premise of like my entire worldview with food is this is it. Everything that you will ever consume, everything you will ever hot take about, everything you will ever try to avoid, for the rest of your life is made of these things, and there's no way around that. Um, this book came out in 2016, and I'm, I've been, for three years, I've been trying to figure out ways to get around this, and I don't think there is one. Um, so these are all ingredients we're very familiar with. Some of them are the things that we constantly bludgeon ourselves uh, with uh, guilt about uh, on the back of an ingredient label. Um, some of them are more behind the scenes workers, but this is it. This is the gatekeepers. So um, our test kitchen is based in Berkeley. We are within that weird magnetosphere of Silicon Valley. Um, it, to continue the uh, apparent string of metaphors that are going to have to do with drugs in this talk, um, Silicon Valley is very much like LSD. Um, it is undeniably powerful. It is often incredibly inspiring and useful, and it is frequently absolutely terrifying with what it will do to distort your perception of reality. Um, living, living that close to Silicon Valley, there is a lot of trying to break this trend. Um, I, I say trend. Trying to break this firmament on, upon which all food stands. I, I would love to make as clear as possible that there is no way to code your way around this. There is no way to market your way around this. There is no way to CRISPR your way around this. Um, if, if, all right, so 
For lunch, I have constructed uh, a uh, crisper edited ultra sweet sweet potato pie that requires no added sugar. On top of it is a 3D printed Chantilly cream uh, flavored with vanilla that is grown in the most biodynamic way possible, um, being fertilized exclusively with a ground up meal of iPhone 5S's and served to you by a autonomous robot that gives you uh, nutrition recommendations based on a chip that's implanted in your molars and will also be a generous and loving romantic life partner should you choose. <laughs> it's still gonna play by these rules. This is, these are, this is the pantheon of sometimes benevolent demigods that are the gatekeepers to anything that we eat. And that is why I, the, the big fancy title is <clears throat> The Food Will Decide. Um, because no matter what happens, all of this, the only reason all of this matters is that at some point or another, somebody's gonna put something in their mouth. And human innovation in food is always gonna have a, a ceiling of materials innovation because the science of soft matter and the way it interacts with our bodies is very, very restricted. Um, lead is an incredible firming agent for pickles. Like if you want the crispiest, like just the best uh, full sour, like deli dill pickle, just a pinch of lead really, really does it great. It also makes your tumors very al dente. Like it is, there, there is a limitation on what the human body can handle. Um, and the, the point of the book and the point of the way that we look at these things is to lay out the rules of how food works um, because each of these ingredients has their own little MO. So this is it. This is everything that water does in every piece of food that we will ever eat or ever come up with. Um, one of my favorite examples to give is up on the right. Water uh, has a big role in dictating flow. So again, in the October issue of Eating Well, there are many saucy things. Um, there's a penne, there's a uh, chicken with like a vinaigrette poured over it. All of the sauces that have ever been published in Eating Well or have ever been created by mankind have been dictated by the idea of putting stuff in water's way to impede its flow from A to B to make stuff thicker. That's it. If it's a tomato sauce, the stuff that's making it thicker are carbs from the pectin in tomatoes and sugar from the, from the sugar in tomatoes. Um, if it's a cheesy, creamy sauce, there's a bunch of little fat droplets that water has to jet ski around as it moves around on your tongue to make that sauce thicker. Um, all of, all of uh, I used to teach at the Culinary Institute of America, um, you could save like three months and, I don't know, a million dollars of student fees um, learning about sauces by just condensing it all into that one little bite and giving, giving people the, the information vitamin that they need to make their sauces whatever texture they want. Um, when we're talking about sustainability in food waste, so water is the ultimate gatekeeper for the shelf life of food. Um, you can remove water, you can dehydrate things, you can bind water up, you can add sugar or salt to cure things, uh, you can immobilize water and freeze it, which is, um, as was mentioned, an incredible way to preserve food. Um, I would argue in terms of quality, it's the number one best innovation that mankind has come up with. Um, it's the only way you're gonna make pesto last more than a week without tasting like not pesto. Um, <clears throat> you can acidify food. You can, you can wage chemical warfare in a good way with microbes. If you don't do that, the only remaining opportunity that you have to make food last kind of forever is just destroying it with heat to prevent microbes from growing, canning food, um, or leaning on things like sodium benzoate and other preservatives that are truly preservatives, that are uh, a, a certain class of molecule that are designed to prevent the growth of life on Earth. Um, in, in my line of work, I'll talk about it in a little bit, uh, we get asked a lot for clean label versions of stuff. So um, let's say you're making a uh, coconut oil based nut butter and you want that nut butter not to go rancid. You wanna extend the shelf life of it, but it's for the natural organic crowd, so you want it to be um, clean label. There are uh, 
distillates, essential oils pulled from things like rosemary and oregano and spinach that are natural antioxidants that can do that. They can help that fat um, stay more uh, fragrantly pleasing for longer. There are no clean label preservatives. That's not a thing. Um, in order, preservative in terms of discouraging microbial growth. There is no carrot-based version of potassium sorbate. Um, in order to make food exist uh, it, sort of separate from time, you have to either pay attention to what the fundamental levers that are, are, mo are being pulled to, to control it, or you have to play by big food industry rules. Um, when we get into another category, like sugar, how, just a quick straw poll, how does everybody in here feel about sugar in 2019? Good? We, are, we, are, are we going long on sugar? So um, I'm going to back up just a little bit to put this in context. Uh, in addition to being a Pantheon, this is also a roulette wheel. And once every five years, one of these things number comes up. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> bad behavior, humans. Um, whenever we get myopically focused on one of these eight capital I ingredients, our food suffers and stuff gets weird. And I mean that both in terms of the 90s when we went to gastrically distressing lengths to not eat fat, all the way to right now where I, I talked to like 15 people about what they're uh, most looking forward to this, this, uh, uh, for this summit. Everybody said the protein talk. Our obsession with protein is like well motivated but it's still one of those things where we get tunnel vision and all we see is protein. There, there are compromises that we start to build into our day-to-day -day DNA when we focus too much on one of these things. Um, let's talk minerals. So minerals, um, they do a lot of things. They make stuff taste salty. They help bind up water. They catalyze a lot of different flavor reactions. Um, <clears throat> since, I don't know, World War II, our relationship with minerals has been a little wonky and specifically sodium. Um, look at like the canned soup industry. There has been this incredible seesaw where everybody was yelling at the canned soup industry for how much sodium they were putting in food, which they were putting that much sodium in food because they were retorting soup, which again, if the, the lever that you're looking to pull to make food last forever is to just napalm it with heat, there are certain things that you need to lean on to make that food taste like something at the end of the day. But the canned food industry was getting yelled at for minerals, uh, specifically sodium, so they turned towards MSG, um, which is uh, pulling a lever that is slightly different than saltiness. It's making food taste savory, uh, making f uh, eliciting umami response. So MSG, all of a sudden, sodium got cut by like 50%, and things were cool until um, some very disgruntled parent bloggers, proto-parent bloggers of the 80s, um, started to decide that MSG was causing all sorts of apparently racially motivated migraines. Um, <laughs> we can dig into that later, but um, so so the 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 canned soup industry seesawed back. They just went back. To, they they Coke classic, Coca Cola classic did um, to go back to their full sodium versions. They tried low sodium versions with nobody bought because it tasted like low sodium canned soup. Um, and then now, um, when I was a grad student at UC Davis, the first uh, trade show I went to was IFT, uh, Institute of Food Technologist show, um, also known as a thousand bites with a thousand secrets. Um, you go around the, the floor trying like a hot dog that has a secret, you try a, a sorbet that has a secret. None of them are insidious, but none of them are great. Um, and, and at IFT, I saw that the, the wave of the future was going to be potassium chloride. I, like, just, just think back to like seventh grade chemistry. It kind of makes sense. Potassium sits right next to sodium on the periodic table. Um, it, it sounds good. We need potassium. Bananas are good. Um, what it, <laughs> what's the problem with table salt and sodium chloride? It's the sodium, sodium bad. All right, potassium chloride, let's do it. If anybody had ever just licked a rock of potassium chloride, like anybody not in a lab coat whose pension was maybe hanging in the balance of this potassium chloride salt working, anybody just licked it once? Has anybody licked potassium chloride, pure potassium chloride? Sophie Egan, what's your uh, opinion on potassium chloride? It tastes like sour metal. 
like if you uh, this like the pole hanging in the in a subway car. <laughs> so they tend to be sour. Human sweat is usually a man. Okay, so um, it, it sort of tastes like truly it tastes it's sour metal, and and it's not the worst taste in the world for people who have like serious heart health problems, and the only way they're getting along right now is potassium chloride. Cool, do that. But it is it, when we get simplistic and we say sodium is the problem, not food coming out of a can tastes bad is the problem. <laughs> um, when we start to blame it on this stuff, our our sense of reality starts to get weird and distorted. So where we are right now with sugars is very entertaining. Um, what's the number one thing that humans like sugar for? Sweet. We like the sweetness. We like that weird thing. Um, sugars are not the only things in nature that are sweet. Um, um, some amino acids are like a little bit sweet. Um, some stuff like sugar alcohols are sweet, but um, they uh, don't make dentists angry at you because bacteria can't grow on them and, and rot your teeth. Um, and then there are things out there like uh, sucralose and aspartame and the, the quote-unquote artificial sweeteners of the Jerry Seinfeld cafe era. Um, where those things, if you had one molecule of table sugar versus one molecule of suc sucralose, one molecule of sucralose is 600 times sweeter than one molecule of sucrose. So in your, I can't remember which sweetener brand it is, but in that packet, um, when you're shaking that packet, it's mostly uh, maltodextrin, it's mostly starch, it's mo mostly a bulking agent, because they want you to be able to use that packet of sweetener at the same use rate as sugar. They don't want you to have to like get super drug dealer and like pull out an eyedropper to, uh, to <laughs> Sweeten your coffee. Um, so great, cool. It it, it will accomplish um, sweetness. It will satisfy the weird hands that grow out of your tongue. Um, it does that in a lot of different ways. But that is not the only thing that sugar does, and that is one of the most important things that people need to start to understand about food. I would love to up the the general proficiency of citizen science of people with food, and I think we can do it with pretty pictures rather than um, equations. But uh, all of these capital I ingredients do all of this stuff all the time, whether you want them to or not. So when you use something like monk fruit, which is, it, it sounds very pastoral. It's like, oh, the, the wisdom of the monks harvested for your sorbet. Um, if you use something like monk fruit that is several hundred times sweeter than table sugar, therefore you're using several hundred times less sugar in, let's, let's say an ice cream, like a low sugar ice cream. Ice cream doesn't just work by sweetness. Ice cream works with sugars controlling the crystallization of water to keep things gritty. Um, it controls the way uh, that an ice cream will melt so that it doesn't just feel like uh, uh, Kool-Aid that just became less wet. Um, it, uh, sugars are responsible for a whole lot of stuff that food does. And so when you try to completely weed out sugars in favor of something else, you have to pick up the pieces of everything that happens here. Um, Ha, have you all seen this uh, looming candy but good for you revolution that we're about to enter? It takes a lot of forms. There are some companies who are like, instead of peanut butter, almond butter. There, fixed it, peanut butter cups for everybody. Um, there, which, great, cool. Uh, there are companies who are saying, um, we're gonna take a, a, a little bit more holistic approach, and instead of rice puffs, we're gonna use quinoa puffs, and instead of um, nameless chocolate that's uh, mostly wax, we're gonna use uh, free trade, ethically sourced, single origin chocolate, and consumers will pay a premium. Um, there are other companies who are like, nah, sugar, gone. Who needs it? We're done. And that works for certain things. Um, you can sweeten chocolate without need for any sugar. Uh, monk fruit sweetened chocolate is a thing. Um, there are some flavor like nits to be picked, but it chemically can happen. What about gummy bears? Has anyone in here consumed a gelatinous bear? <laughs> cool. So the way those gelatinous bears work, um, the the archetypal like historical gelatinous bear, um, they they do not require refrigeration, correct? The way they do not require refrigeration and yet are so pleasantly juicy 
is because water is behind the scenes chemically binding, or sugar is behind the scenes chemically binding water. So you can have, it, gummy bears are not dehydrated uh, beet chips. They have a, a juicy, moist feeling to them because there is still water there. It is just prevented from molding and providing a safe haven for listeria to grow because there's a bunch of sugar there. So okay, let's say uh, you are me, your job is to make food products for people, and somebody in like a very nice suit comes to you and says, here's $20 million, make me a sugar-free gummy bear. Okay, we make it sweet. How do we make it not kill people? It, is it possible? Has anybody seen some of these uh, brands that I am verbally subtweeting right now? Yeah? It, what, what's, the market, it, what's the marketing behind a gummy bear with no sugar? And guilt-free. And, and a lot of them are starting to say no sugar alcohols, which is the form of like xylitol, like, uh, you know, uh, sugar-free gum. Okay, no sugar alcohols, then what else are they using? Fiber. So <clears throat> if we back up, this all has a point, I promise. Um, carbs and sugar, obviously sugar is a very simple form of carb, but sugar and complex carbs, starch, fiber, um, other polysaccharides, they don't behave at all like each other in food. But every little link in that carb chain is potentially a sugar. And what the innovation of the past few years has become is in everything from like a kind bar bound up with chicory syrup. Have you guys seen chicory syrup on like every label of everything? Um, to these companies that are making gummy bears without sugar. Um, the, the big innovation has been to chop up carbs to just small enough pieces that they will interact with and absorb water in a similar way to sugar, but if your source carb isn't something like starch that your body can just dismantle and turn into energy regardless of size, and it is instead something fibrous, if you're chopping up little pieces of stuff that you can't digest, if you figure out the right balance, you get them small enough where they'll do stuff for you, but big enough where you still can't digest them, and you get a fiber that can sort of stand on its hind legs and act like sugar. <clears throat> Why do we like fiber? Well, how does it help digest? Like, is there a wand involved? How, how, does, it, how does it help digestion? Rough it, but, but what does it do? It feeds bacteria, right? It's, it's stuff that survives uh, the chemical warfare of your upper uh, GI tract so that bacteria can grow on it and probiotics, prebiotics, buzz, buzz, buzz. It will pull water out of your large intestine and help reduce inflammation, all that sort of stuff. But what does it actually, what does it not do? It doesn't get digested. So when you eat a ton of stuff that you can't digest, what tends to happen? People who are alive when olestra. For real, like this, this is, this sounds like I'm, I'm I, I promise I'm not being flippant for no reason. This is a weird thing. This is a weird cultural amnesia that we have where we say, Ah, it didn't work out so well last time. Let's do the exact same thing 15 years later. But, but now nobody tucks in their shirt, so we're good. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, those companies are making like millions of dollars. Um, there, there are a lot of, uh, there, there's, a, there's a big gold rush right now for cracking in an ever decaying world uh, a sense of nostalgia with a sense of less guilt. And I, honestly, if it like, if it gives you a vacation and, and you, can, you can feel some sense of like a spark of joy eating a bag of gummy bears that has like 40 grams of fiber, do it, <laughs> cool. But just like, we're not, we're not splitting atoms. This is not tr necessarily true innovation. This is just jumbling stuff around and trying to find a free lunch when there's arguably none to be found. Now. I, I, I'm, I am actually, despite everything that I just said in the past like 20 minutes, I'm a super optimistic person. Um, I think that, however, we are losing a lot of great opportunities to do stuff that is actually delicious, good for us, good for the planet, et cetera, because we keep trying to hit grand slams when there are a lot of singles and doubles to be had. And 
that can happen by looking at just the boring old world of food that we already know. So um, when I talk about food, I like talking about it as a toolbox. So when you look at butter, it's not just butter. It's not just this thing to be uh, fetishized and, or, or reviled. It's, it's just water, lipids, a pro little bit of protein, a little bit of sugar, a little bit of minerals. That's what butter is. And when you're making a croissant, you are relying on the fact that the specific lipids in butter are solid at room temperature. So you can separate individual layers of gluten-y, delicious croissant dough. When you are trying to make something turn gold and brown in the oven, I believe there is a recipe in the October issue that talks about brushing something so that it becomes gold and brown. You are sacrificing proteins and sugars to the fires so that they will uh, decompose and become brown. That's, that's all this stuff is doing. And so if you want to make something that behaves like butter but is not, you got to replicate each of these things. And so again, with butter, we've, we've been trying to get away from butter. We just can't quit butter. We've been trying to get away from butter for a long time. So uh, when the trans fat kind of wave hit, we were saying, okay, butter works the way it does because it's a bunch of saturated fats that will stand up straight at room temperature and make them spreadable rather than just oil. So what if we take oily fats, what if we chemically force them into rigidity with hydrogenation or partial hydrogenation, and we get something that I can't believe it isn't that, right? <laughs> there were health concerns. So we went on to the next thing, which was palm oil. So the palm fruit um, it lives in a tropical climate. There's a lot of stuff that its metabolism does to respond to the realities of that um, existence. It naturally has a lot of really saturated fat. And that saturated fat like never goes rancid. It doesn't mess with uh, uh, a lot of flavor profiles of food. It's fairly economical to produce. But also there's like a bunch of really wrong stuff about the way that it's, it's brought to your table frequently, sometimes not. Um, so, uh, you know, bada bing, Dr. Oz, palm fat is no longer a thing um, that most people want to consume. Uh, so then we went on to coconut oil. 101 uses for coconut oil. Put coconut in your bank account and watch your money grow. You know, like, it all happened. Uh, then some study said maybe coconut oil is not the only thing that you should be brushing your teeth and putting, your, putting on your feet. Um, and coconut oil sort of fell out of favor. Coconut oil had some functional problems. Um, coconut oil uh, does weird stuff to chocolate. Um, nicely tempered, shiny, crispy, glossy chocolate will become dull and bloom fairly quickly if you're using coconut oil instead of palm oil or just using cocoa butter. Um, so then we said, okay, maybe not cocoa butter. How are we gonna make this butter? Um, I just talked to an ingredient supplier last week who is uh, trying to commercialize shea butter. The same like creamy, luminous shea butter for human consumption. Um, shea butter frequently has a smoky flavor, so they're trying to figure out how to pull that out. The, the, the moral of the story is it's never gonna happen. There's never gonna be a perfect substitute. There are things that are gonna have their own strengths that we're gonna lean into, but this is the new alchemy. And I don't mean that in a, in a positive light. <laughs> I mean that in that alchemy is impossible. We can't turn shit into gold. <laughs> and, and yet here we are trying again, and again and again and again, to violate these fundamental principles. And I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not, I'm not attacking it out of some puritanical sense of like, ah, oh, Bob Dylan shouldn't be allowed to play electric guitar. Like this is, this, it's just, it's, it's energy invested that I think could pay a lot more dividends if we played within the rules of food rather than trying over and over and over again across generations to, to defy them. Does that make sense? Okay, these are the rules. Um, the, where we want to transition is, Food is a toolbox, the reason I get really uh, sleepy when people say future a bunch is because food is a very stupid toolbox. Food is so much dumber than we are. Food is the dumbest substrate that human beings try to innovate around. Um, and it, it, that's, that's something that we need to reckon with. Again, when you're working with lines of code and you're working with alloys and you're working with synthetic polymers, you can make a, a t-shirt that will probably predict your future and like the day you're gonna die. Like that may happen. I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a materials engineer, but I'm pretty sure that's possible. Um, we will never get around these hurdles in food. And so when we start getting carried away with being starstruck by technology and by people on stage in well-lit rooms with microphones about just imagine what would be possible. 
um, it's kind of right here. And, and it would behoove us to start working around within this stupid toolbox a little bit more. So um, like was mentioned in the intro, I spend my day um, in a test kitchen in Berkeley. Uh, our company is called Pilot R&D. It's me and a couple co-founders and, and a, just, it's a team of like seven. Um, we come from a hybrid background of food science and uh, chefery. So uh, the founders of our company were at some point working with chefs. So I worked with the folks at Tartine uh, Bakery in, in San Francisco quite a bit. Um, my partner Dan was head of uh, R&D for Momofuku and all of the David Chang restaurants for a while. We came from this world of helping uh, borderline psychopaths figure out how to make really, really great food. <laughs> and and uh, I, say, <laughs> I say that lovingly, but when you talk about innovation, when, when somebody says, here's the spice trends that are gonna be hot in the next two to five years, and it's like, maybe grains of paradise are gonna start popping up on somebody's radar. Cool. Um, you got like three years to batten down the hatches and figure out how to make grains of paradise and nutritional yeast seasoned popcorn tasty, which would probably be really good. Um, in this world, um, a chef would be like, we have $1,000 worth of hand-picked grains of paradise. They need to be amazing in three hours. <laughs> um, please figure out how to do this. And so uh, my partners and I have this weird set of uh, emotional scars and expertise that comes from uh, being in this crucible of innovation that is not, you know, let's go into the retail world and tell people they need to put grains of paradise into a protein bar and that it should take 40 uh, interns to assemble a single protein bar. It's nothing about making stuff chefy. It's about reasonable, methodical problem solving. Where in that world that we come from, there is no silver bullet. There's no like one modified starch. There's no like perfect sugar substitute that cracks the cracks the case. It's all a series of um, overlapping and uh, sort of interconnected parts. So we'll look at what a product is made of, what kind of flavor profile we're going for. We'll look at how it's made, what equipment is being made to use it, um, what, what order of addition the ingredients are going in. We'll look at everything holistically in order to solve problems in food. And so uh, we came from the restaurant world, we still work with a lot of restaurants, but the majority of our clients are retail packaged food companies, um, which 20 years ago uh, would have meant like frozen pasta and uh, saltine crackers. Now it's it's everything. Have you guys ever been to any of the like natural food expos or fancy foods or anything like that? There is more innovation. There are more new food products in like one season in 2019 than in the 60s. I'd, like not and not at all joking. Um, and what we do uh, is we help people figure out how to make that stuff happen on a timeline that it's never happened before within a system that is not ready for it. So to give you an example, this, this is um, something that we just slapped together for social media the other day. We were trying to do um, uh, like a quinoa raspberry white chocolate bark. Um, like crunchy puffed quinoa, uh, freeze dried raspberries, little things of white chocolate. Somebody on social media said, cool, what if vegan? <clears throat> said, okay, um, vegan white chocolate. Let's, let's pretend that was a brief. Somebody said, we want to launch a line of vegan white chocolate. What are the ingredients in white chocolate? Cocoa butter. I think the FDA mandates that it's like 10 to 14% milk solids by weight. Um, and then usually vanilla and lecithin and, and et cetera. Okay, so the, the, the practical, like skipping the chemistry, the, the pragmatic question here would be, if one of our clients asked us to make them a, white, a vegan white chocolate bar, if they are not trying to produce uh, 100 million units of that bar and like buy their own plant, they're gonna be at the mercy of what is commercially available B2B in the industry. So consumers are like, I really want a vegan white chocolate bar. There are companies out there that really wanna bring consumers a vegan white chocolate bar, but until the big chocolate suppliers start to carry vegan white chocolate as a skew in their inventory, there has to be a lot of maneuvering and massaging to get that to happen. So, okay, if we wanna make a vegan white chocolate bar, the first thing that we look at is what ingredients are available. Question one, is there just like bulk vegan white chocolate that we can melt down and cast into the shape of like a planet that's also a heart? Um, no, <laughs> there is not. Um, so 
what else what else could we do okay so there there is uh, a lot of really good finely ground rice flour out there and there are companies who are making rice milk chocolate have you guys seen that allergen free milk chocolate where they use um, like rice flour as a milkifier to give a feeling of starchy creaminess and not just pure fat melting on your tongue so um, what if we used rice flour uh, we could go through all of that and, and get it going um, a lot of our clients right now are trying to make stuff paleo. Um, we'll say, is, we sincerely don't know, we'll say, is rice flour paleo? They'll ask a caveman. The caveman will say, no, uh, the things that are paleo are arrowroot, uh, fava beans, mung beans, and coconut. Cool. So we will, at some point, need to track those ingredients down. So for a, for a day in the life of us, we'll get um, a ton of ingredient samples our, we are just like a nonstop um, like drive-in diner for FedEx drivers where they'll come, eat something weird, and then leave. Um, and we get ingredient samples uh, probably 15 times a day. And if we're looking at something like kelp powder, we will probably taste 15 different kinds of kelp powder to find the one to match whatever our client is trying to do for their consumer base. So in a lot of uh, kelp powders, um, people would probably use a bul anti bulking agent. So they'll probably use something like silica dioxide, sand, glass. They'll probably use something like maltodextrin. Um, things that should be declared on ingredient labels, but most people don't. Um, and a lot of our clients have sort of become uh, obsessive detailists with what these things are made of. So we'll go through, we'll screen what actually works, what works with their MLQ. So people really, I mean, consumers are talking about, I want, I want to know where my food is coming from. I want it to be like these smaller, more personal companies. They are being squeezed by the fact that the people who are dehydrating green bell peppers, this is not an exaggeration, will only sell you a truckload of dehydrated green bell pepper. <laughs> um, if you're trying to launch like a, a salad protein bar, like a bunch of dehydrated greens pressed into a protein bar, um, an average startup run for like a small company that'll get into northeast region of Whole Foods is like uh, 10 to 50,000 bars. That would take uh, probably like 10 years to get through that minimum order quantity. So, so these are the kinds of things that as, as innovators, there's a lot of just weird, boring like business mechanics that we have to think about. Um, so as we go through all of this and we start to feel out what tastes good, we start to narrow in on what the options are. And then, um, <clears throat> When we have a formulation queued up, um, we figure out how to make it. This is just a stock image of a 3D printer. I have a 3D printer rant that I'm going to go on later. Will that offend anybody's 3D printing sensibilities? Cool. This is not what our test kitchen looks like. This is what our test kitchen looks like. It's just the kitchen. Um, technology is so sexy in so many spheres of our human existence that it warps our brains about what it can do for food. Um, we launch about, we, we help our clients launch about 40 different food products a year. And I mean everything from bone broth, to chocolate, to ice cream, to snacks, uh, brownies. Um, we're working on a bunch of uh, iced coffee. Um, we are putting CBD into a preposterous number of things. All of that comes out of a kitchen that is very rudimentary because the other end, the, the, the manufacturers who are gonna make all of these products, are the same manufacturers who were just putting saltine crackers into different colored boxes for most of the 20th century. And so we have to figure out how to fit all these really, really smart ideas into very, very simple machinery. So I, I'm sure everybody in here has some, there's some food brand that you are a devotee of, that you are really impressed by what they're doing. They are producing that beautiful product alongside whatever version of that product you hate the most. Not, not meaning that there's cross-contamination or anything like that. I mean that they are at the mercy of the same co-packers, the same ingredient industry. All of that has to go through the same funnel. And so, like I've said, we are not consumer experts. We are not uh, nutritionists. But we do sit at the spout from whence new food flows. So we see some stuff. We notice some stuff on the way. And um, one of the biggest things that is, I'd say, the biggest hurdle in the way that we work is uh, the the sense of divorce between wanting whole foods, that's the number one f uh, food trend that's not going anywhere anytime soon, is whole recognizable ingredients. Um, you can be as protein obsessed as you want, 
but it, you're never going to get that mad at a potato if it's a potato. Um, whole ingredients, there is a sense of, of just divorced reality between whole ingredients and the lack of control that they entail. So if you want to if you want to make something that has um, the flavor of Doritos, but 20 grams of protein per serving, and is cost competitive with Doritos, and is only made out of whole fruits and vegetables, like I, I can't take your money um, because it's it's not going to work. And so what we do a lot is we try to reconcile how to take whole blueberries, how to take, um, instead of tapioca starch, how to take whole cassava root, ground and dried, cassava flour, and how to funnel those things, those ingredients that are much more the spirit of what consumers want to eat into the reality of what can be produced. And that takes an insane amount of, of creative problem solving. And the fun thing is, we, we do not have all the answers. So this is um, Jen, Justin, and Dana. They're part of the pilot team. Um, we, we tell all of our clients on the, on the first day, if you are trying to make a gluten-free pasta, there are things that gluten-free pasta can and can't do. If you want a gluten-free pasta to do something that's impossible, we will help sort of steer you in a direction that is possible before taking your money, because otherwise nobody's happy. And one of the things that we tell people is, we are not going to pitch a perfect game. It is impossible to innovate in food in a way where you foresee everything, because as much as I've said food is simple and stupid, it's simple in the fundamental rules, but in practice, it is incredibly complex and unpredictable. And so there's stuff that we're only going to know by tasting it. And so what we try to do with our projects is get into the test kitchen and taste stuff and see how something browns in the pan as early on as possible. So we had a project where somebody was looking at making a high-protein vinaigrette. <laughs> um, and uh, what we said off, off the front is one of the fundamental principles of protein is that it's affected by acid, um, but we will try. And they said, no, no, we, we have this proprietary technology. We've been um, working on this uh, amazing form of altered for the sake of proprietary information, mung bean protein. Um, our mung bean protein is impervious to acid. Cool. Okay. So we put it in some distilled vinegar. It worked great. Um, we mix it with some olive oil, it worked great. And they said, here's the skews uh, that we want to make this, this vinaigrette into because here's the things that we studied um, our consumer is going to gravitate towards. One of the must-haves was a strawberry mung bean protein vinaigrette. Uh, you know, like strawberry balsamic kind of vinaigrette, but with like a ton of protein. Um, we said, great, that, I mean, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's get into it. So we had a little oyster party because we live in the Bay Area and there's just always oysters just flowing in through the window. Um, and we decided all these little, um, these little deli containers, these are all different prototypes of the vinaigrette. And so we're like, let's put this into place. Let's, let's try it as a mignonette. And we get to this one, which was the strawberry with mung bean protein. And the texture was great. We were really worried that the protein was going to coagulate and make it fall out of solution and, and just make it not feel like a vinaigrette at all. It looked great. It uh, processed exactly in the way that the um, dressing manufacturer specified it must. Everything was good. And after three days um, of, of existence, one of us tasted that. Uh, actually, uh, Jen tasted that. I was like, hey, can you guys come just give it a, give it a smell? And... Um, uh, I came over and I was like, oh my God. Um, and I waved Dana and Justin and Jen and Anne and all these people over. I said, you guys, we have created O de Rubber Halloween Mask. <laughs> I, it, it was the most uncanny thing I have ever experienced. It was the exact taste and like build and release of the smell of a like rubber, like a scream mask from childhood, and it was so bitter, and it was so disgusting. It was this, this, this crazy thing where nobody had ever combined strawberry, like whole strawberry puree, with this weird mung bean protein before, and it was the most unholy thing I have ever experienced. And that's, that's the thing where on paper it sounds great. It's like we, we guarantee we have a soluble protein. We guarantee that people love strawberry balsamic vinaigrette. Let's put it into action. Eh. 
food and science said nay. So that's that's a little bit of the day in life of um, how we go through certain uh, these sorts of things. Um, actually, I, I want to give I want to give one more example. Um, I know sustainability is going to be a huge huge conversation over the course of today. Um, we through our own brand through Render we launched a beverage um, that uses repurposed dairy whey as uh, the base for like a fruity sparkling beverage. Um, for every I don't know gallon of yogurt that's produced, it's like eight gallons of of whey. Um, I don't know if that's the exact ratio, but it is an incredible amount of stuff that you, uh, big yogurt companies, cheese companies, have to pay quite a lot of money to have disposed of properly and responsibly, so it's not just getting poured into a creek and screwing with the local flora. Um, so for us, um, we work with a lot of chefs, um, including um, the chefs of Bar Tartine, former Bar Tartine, um, who in their restaurant make an incredible amount of delicious fresh cheese. And they had this idea where they take all the whey left over from making their fresh cheese and they put it into like colas. They put it into tonics and spritzers and they use it not necessarily as a sweetener, but as a way to give something that doesn't have a ton of sugar, just kind of like intangible body. And it's this thing where instead of diluting um, uh, strawberry and fennel and tarragon with uh, water, uh, you add slightly acidic, slightly tangy, slightly creamy dairy whey, and it's this incredible flavor experience. So we were like, great, we have all these flavors. We had a, a cranberry hibiscus ginger, uh, we have a blueberry orange juniper, it kind of tastes like gin. We had all these amazing flavor profiles. We tried them over the course of about a year and a half in a gazillion ways on our bench top. We carbonated them at different levels, um, we tried them in a bunch of different glass bottles. We were all queued up to go into production. And in order to wrangle dairy whey from a local Sonoma County cheese company that was like right next to the bottling company we wanted to use, um, it took about six months to figure out the mechanics of how that company would feel properly indemnified against anything bad happening with this product that they're not intending to sell, that they really, really want to save, but they need to responsibly see it go out the door. We had to figure out the mechanics of just how to get like liquid totes full of whey um, from Petaluma uh, up to Santa Rosa. Um, we had to figure out uh, if we were gonna generate uh, a C of A, a certificate of analysis of um, what could happen so that we could show the California Department of um, Farming and Ag Food and Ag Agriculture um, if they came a knocking. There was a ton of like interstitial nitty gritty that needed to be fig figured out. So then we got into the pr processing facility um, this is a facility that makes like sparkling cider. They make a lot of the LaCroix spin drifty kind of uh, lightly sweetened sparkling beverages. We explained everything to them and they were like, yeah, this is gonna be great. This, this is gonna work just fine. Um, we mix the first, we mix the strawberry flavor up in a tank. Um, we put it into the carbonation tank, we get it going. And uh, as it's going into the first couple of bottles, it just overflows with foam. Like, like Barbasol foam just like flowing out of the top like a, like a Dairy Queen, like little like curly cue at the top. Insane amounts of foam. And for the carbonated beverage world, foam is death. Foam is the thing that will keep you from actively being able to make a bottle of carbonated beverage. And they were like, we have never seen this before. This is, this is like truly it was shaving cream foam. There's, there's a photo somewhere of me looking very, very sad, but with just like strawberry lather all over my face. Um, and they were like, all right, well, we have an anti-foamer, which um, most of the industry uses anti-foamers. Um, they are typically oil. They're, it's like canola oil derivatives that are put in trace amounts into every bottle of everything sparkling that you consume um, that are meant to chemically inhibit um, foaming from happening. And we tried the anti-foamer and it was like, nah. The foam said, no, get out of here. So we had to go back to the drawing board and we figured out that you actually have to heat this whey that we're taking from these cheese makers, basically create ricotta cheese. You have to like boil whey, create a bunch of ricotta, take that whey and then put it into this for it, in order for it to work. And we were like, okay, cool. Uh, that's gonna be another product line. And the, the moral of, of, that, of that little story is waste stream upcycling, if you're gonna do something other than just put it into a protein bar, is very, very difficult. And there's so much like mechanics involved, but it will often lead 
to a bunch of other ideas. If you're paying attention, if you have the time, if you have the, the capital to do so. Um, and when we start looking towards the future of all of this stuff, and we're trying to figure out like what, what is that gonna be made of in 2045? Here's like, uh, I just wanna close before we get to, to questions, but here's a couple of things um, that we should look at. Number one, and I alluded to this before, is where this stuff is being produced. I, so this again is just like a stock photo of a food production facility. I think this is near Chernobyl. Like I don't think this is an actual like, no, I'm not kidding. Like I don't think this is an actual in use um, factory. But um, this is a uh, this is what most big tunnel ovens look like. Um, this is where all of your favorite gluten free crackers are baked, and they are about that new. Most of the most of the equipment in production facilities where everything that you consume as a retail consumer is about in this state of repair. Um, it's clean, like they, they're power washing the floors, it's not like a, a filthy, it's, I'm not trying to Upton Sinclair the cracker industry, like this is, it's, it's clean, but it's rickety. And um, what that means is that there is a profound amount of waste that comes out of this industry. So for every cracker that's baked, when, it, when a cracker goes through a tunnel oven, have you guys seen like a how it's made or video of this sort of thing? So what happens is you get a big mixer that's no different than just a big KitchenAid that's mixing the cracker dough. The cracker dough gets um, put through rollers and put onto a sheet that uh, flows on um, like the Quiznos uh, tunnel oven. You know, the, the oven that's just like on a conveyor. Um, on a 200 foot long, uh, 10 foot wide version of that. And uh, it goes through like a series of pizza cutters that cut it lengthwise, and then there's a guillotine that chops it into little squares for your, you know, cheese it or whatever. As that goes through a tunnel oven, um, the dynamics of how heat and air flow over an oven make it so that the inside of that band gets much less cooked than the outside. It's fully like penguins in Antarctica, like huddling together. The ones on the outside are more exposed to the temperature elements. The ones on the inside are more insulated. So what happens is, <clears throat> for most cracker production that I've ever seen, I, I have never seen like a Ritz cracker line, but on the, on the scale of like millions of crackers being made, there are, if there's uh, 30 crackers across a row going through this oven, the outer one or two rows on either side are burned and thrown immediately away. Like immediately, like there, there's usually little like bowling alley bumpers that just direct them straight into a trash can. Like self-driving car, cool. Somebody fix that stupid thing with like ten thousand dollars. Truly, like that. That's we should. We have the technology to figure that out. But um, I've been to most of the large cracker production facilities in the country, and nobody has even given it a second thought. Um, the other thing is when we talk about sustainability. For a lot of people, it's upcycling. For a lot of people, it's, uh, it's eating less meat. It's, it's more sustainable agriculture. Um, the amount of waste that happens in factories before it ever leaves the factory floor is preposterous. Um, most, most companies, whether it's beverage bottling or a chocolate uh, production line or a puffed snack line, um, if you're gonna go in, you're gonna do a trial day. It typically costs between 30 and $100,000 to get all the ingredients and equipment and, and do the facility. And almost every, uh, co-packer, co-manufacturer, is under the impression that you are just going to throw that stuff away. Or maybe take like two cases of it for sale samples for your Whole Foods meeting. And um, I know this because we've gone in a couple of times and said, hey, for us or our client, we're on a shoestring budget. We just like phys financially cannot afford to not have this product for sale or for show at this food show or whatever. And we've done a lot of uh, sort of homework ahead of time to figure out how we can actually capture this stuff, make it well, make it inspect, make it safe, and sell it on the first time. And um, we have been told by I think four or five different facilities that that was the first time ever that a test run day was not thrown in the trash in their you know 50 years of being in a facility. And that's, that's a test run day for like us starting up. When a massive inter, you know, international CPG company is doing stuff, Every time they introduce uh, a new flavor, a new form factor, like every time those like Jar Jar Binks limited edition um, animal crackers come out for the release of Star Wars, 
um, there is probably millions of Jar Jar Binks shaped crackers that are thrown away as they figure out the tooling for the machine. I, now, I, like this is not like big food doesn't care about waste. It's it's this is a problem that's part of the culture of this that is because of some weird technological limitations. Somebody invest like five hundred million dollars in fixing this rather than um, you know the next carb free popcorn brand that comes on the market or something. Um, Ingredients. So uh, the world of paleo vegan food, um, a lot of it relies on coconut milk. Um, up until about six months ago, there was no clean label coconut milk powder on the market that we were aware of. What I mean is, every if you just wanted powdered coconut milk, so you could make a vegan like ranch potato chip. You want to make like vegan ranch seasoning with like coconut milk and garlic powder and dried parsley. Every coconut milk powder that was being produced that was available in the United States had maltodextrin, either from tapioca or corn. And for the type of people who are really concerned about making vegan food, they're usually concerned about stuff being really clean label. Their consumer doesn't know what maltodextrin is, and so it's just a total non-starter. And we had a conversation with a company like three years ago. We said, hey, if you guys ever come up with this, we will put it into every product that we make because it would be incredibly useful as a way to just have coconut milk that was creamy and dissolved on your tongue and didn't have a bunch of crap in it. It finally happened, and it took three years. And that was just coming from us. We are, we, we're nobody. We have no sway in the industry um, compared to what, frankly, the public and the media have to put pressure on uh, showing these trends and, and forecasting all this stuff. If you ask for it, a lot of this stuff is possible. I'm not talking about genetically engineering a coconut from not coconut. These, the, like, those are incredible feats of, of summiting Everest in the food world. This is just like, please find something else to put in this so it'll dry nice. Um, and so a lot of these, these um, loftier problems of what need to be solved are missing some of the points of what can make a huge difference in helping people eat less animal products immediately. Um, and then the, the last thing that I, I want to leave us with um, before we get into the day and get into some questions is... I, I love to close on this, but when we look at this very simplistic view of food, of a walnut or a tomato or an egg, there's a lot of baggage associated with that. Not bad baggage, but you look at a tomato, you're instantly feeling a little Tuscan. Um, if you look at a walnut, you may immediately conjure up this like, oh, brain health, um, you know, superfood. I used to eat walnuts as a kid. There's just a lot of associations that we have with food that make food one of the hardest spheres of existence to think clearly in. Um, people tend to turn off their brains when a food conversation starts. And I try to encourage people to look at food as this set of toolboxes, partially to help extricate ourselves from all that baggage that we have about what food is or what food can be, and kind of walk this line where this opens up some possibilities. It also makes us much better bullshit checkers. Like, as consumers, as journalists, as investors, as entrepreneurs, I, I think we need to start heading stuff off at the pass a little bit quicker. Our, our, the number of shots that we're going to be allowed to take in making good food to fit whatever environment we are, we are faced with is going to become slimmer and slimmer. We're not going to have as much time to dally around with ideas that should have been dead in the water from day one. And we don't have the luxury of keeping the status quo at tomatoes are Italian, um, let's sun dry them and put them on penne. Um, we need to start looking at these things as sort of a balance between um, what can be and, and a reasonable realism of what can't be. And can I, can I do my 3D printing thing? Okay, so let's stop, let's all um, make a joint vow to stop talking about 3D printing for food. For real. So um, 3D printing, the, the fundamental function of 3D printing is you have something that is liquid that is combined with some sort of catalyst that turns it solid at the exact moment to be dropped onto uh, a substrate. That is very rare in food. Most of the things that do that are like sugar and chocolate. You can make the dopest wedding cake toppers with 3D printing. Um, you can make really cool, uh, like, cubist chocolate sculptures with 3D printing. You can make pretty mediocre pizza with 3D printing. And anybody who wants to 3D print a pizza crust has never rolled out a pizza crust. 
and seeing that that is not the part of our food system that is broken and needs to be fixed. <laughs> and, and, and it's a thing where, like, we should have called this out a long time ago. Like, and again, I have nothing against anybody who's trying to make food better and who has a great idea. But there, there is, there's just a separation from reality if we are investing millions of dollars in this technology that requires um, the opposite of whole recognizable food products, that requires the opposite of leaning on sugar, um, fat, and certain kinds of carbohydrate gelling agents to make stuff take form, just because we can. <laughs> um, I, again, I, I, I may be wrong, I don't think I am. I may be wrong about 3D printing. Um, Honestly, we need 3D printing in the food industry in a, in a huge way. If you could put a 3D printer into every food manufacturer so that they don't have to pay like $50,000 for change parts just because you want to use a different bottle that doesn't use single-use plastic, that would be amazing. If they could like 3D print parts for production lines for, for, uh, for food production, that is an incredibly valuable use. We don't need a better way to roll out pizza crust. There are so many ways to do that. Um, that's all I got. Thank you, guys. <laughs> we have a couple minutes for questions? Cool. They, they can be angry questions. I'm down. Let's go. Yes? Am I talking? Okay. Um, hi, thank you for that. Um, I am a food editor here at Meredith, and I receive a lot of new product samples. A shocking number of them taste not good at all. And my question is, what is the economics behind that? Is it because they don't notice, they think we won't notice, or they're just so far down the line that they have to release it anyway? So I know I've been very diplomatic and pulled a lot of punches so far. Um, this, this is something that is very present in my mind. Um, we talk to, we're at a point right now where um, our clients for Pilot, um, are, we don't do any marketing. So it's people who find us through word of mouth. Sometimes it's investors. So we, we made somebody a great uh, bottled iced tea an investor in that company was like, hey, that was great. Can you guys help us work on this like watermelon water or whatever it's gonna be? Um, we've had a lot of conversations with these like investors and VCs and, and all these people who are providing money for these new products to come to your desk. And you're not wrong. Um, I've heard from a lot of investors firsthand that the, the quality of the food is something that they kind of hand wave if it has a really great brand story and like 100,000 Instagram followers who interact with the account, they, they're like, yeah, it's super bitter, but whatever. It's got a cool package. I mean, truly, like that, that is the attitude in a lot of this. Um, a lot of the companies that are out there getting the really like eye-popping fundraises um, are companies that like, and, and this is not as like a pretentious chef. I, I, I try, I'm very democratic about the kind of food I enjoy. I don't care about price point, I don't care about provenance. If it's tasty, great. There's a lot of just objectively undelicious food. Um, for some people, we, we are in the era of food where branding is very important. Um, that I guess that's always been, but it's, it's important in a more millennial way right now. And so having something that sizzles is uh, a little bit more important than something that tastes good. Um, we're also in the era of everything, <clears throat> all your food products, need to be like Nike pumps. Like they all need to make you jump higher and like live longer and have more shiny fingernails. Um, the, the functional food argument is very easy. And we actually have had clients who say, oh, this um, ginger turmeric uh, like sweet tart is great. Um, it's not bitter enough. I think our client's gonna want a little bit of like maybe aggressive bitterness so they know it's working. I'm not kidding, it's like haptic feedback for your food. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, that's just kind of what's going on. Um, a, a lot of companies, we, we were making a candy bar once, um, like a, a healthier candy bar, that ended up having, um, let's see, if like, a, if like a Milky Way bar is like 20 something grams of sugar per serving, um, this was like six. And um, one, of our, one of our clients, we did a round of tasting and they said, this is really good. Honestly, it feels a little bit too unhealthy. 
can we make it feel a little bit more like an RX bar? Be, be, like they were like the caramel's really smooth and stretchy and it like hits all these things. We can't believe that it doesn't have the, the you know a higher amount of sugar. We're worried our client won't or our customer base won't either. Can you make it slightly less good? It, it's like the that um, the Christian Bale and Hugh Jackman, The Prestige. You guys ever see that Christopher Nolan movie where it's like a good like a true magic and audience won't even know like what to appreciate. You have to dress it up a little bit and show them some rough edges so that they can get some context for the magic trick. Um, there is a little bit of that. There is a little bit of people are just chasing brands, and there is a little bit of just people are really chasing function. They they actively don't care if it tastes bad, and I mean that's why unsweet green juice is a thing. I like I'm not here to defend uh, kale pureed with celery, spinach, and cucumber, and ginger and cayenne as like balanced. There is no salt, fat, acid, heat kind of thing going on there. Um, it's it's not good, but it tastes like I'm doing the right thing, and I am a consumer of that, and you know how um, persnickety I am about stuff. So it's all of that at once. Does that answer? Okay, yeah. One up front? Do you wanna just shout it? Thank you. Since you mentioned being in the Silicon Valley bubble and we're talking about the future of food, I wanted to ask you about Soylent and other quote unquote foods that are just designed to replace what we actually eat with nutrition and nutrients. Yeah, um, I have, again, I have no like Puritan aversion to that as an idea. Um, those are projects we don't accept. Um, we work in every category of food except for baby food, pet food, and things along the lines of Soylent frankly, because that's not our skill set. So we will only work on food where our ability to make stuff taste as good as it can is the point. Um, now, people, our, our job is a little bit harder because people keep finding ingredients in Soylent that they think are making them sick. Um, this, that's a lot of where like carrageenan and a lot of these like seaweed extract thickeners started to uh, get this reputation as being things that are inflaming your gut. I'm happy to not use them, and again, I'm I'm a I'm very um, agnostic when it comes to what kind of stuff I eat and don't. Um, but it is that old like uh, I want a Big Mac value combo, but a Diet Coke, um, where it's like I'm gonna just forego food. Food is for the plebs, um, <laughs> and yet it's this one ingredient in this non-drink that is making me sick. So I, there, there is there. I think there's a little bit of intellectual strife that comes from that. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm friends with computer engineers. I know people who consume Soylent. Um, it, there are versions of it that actually don't taste like the worst thing I've ever had. I've had worse things than Soylent, but the ethos of it is really scary, um, and it's just not something that we do because like they would be paying us more money than they need to to just have somebody formulate um, something that has all the vitamins and sort of paints by the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> All right, uh, my name is Michael Stebbins and I'm with uh, GMO Answers and we have a website that talks about GMOs and we were at IFT last year. So I definitely understand your kind of your <laughs> experience while kind of walking around the floor at IFT or any of the other uh, shows like that. And one of the things that we were getting a lot were food scientists coming to us talking about the demands that are getting put on them by their own marketing teams. Oh, yeah. They want us, you know, they're making all these promises that the food scientists are like, no, we can't do that. We can't source that. It doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah. So how do you kind of as a recommend as a community of, you know, food, you know, whether it's scientists, dietitians, you know, chefs, whatever, how do you reconcile what marketing is promising versus what the science can deliver? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we try to head it off at the pass. Um, if somebody's coming to us with a new food product, I, I think I alluded to this, um, we try to get involved in the conversation when marketing is developing these briefs. Not to say like, we think your consumer insights are wrong or anything like that, but just to interpret, if you really want something that is maple flavored, but you want no natural flavors, no artificial flavors, and zero sugar, the, <laughs> like the, the, the log cabin syrup of our nostalgia does not exist in Vermont. <laughs> you guys know. Um, it's, 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 ma like, maple, maple flavor is not biologically strong enough 
to deliver the kind of impact that people want in a maple protein bar without natural flavors sprinkled on top of it, or a lot of sugar. Like, if, if you would allow me to put like 20 grams of maple syrup derived sugar into a bar, that son of a gun's gonna taste like maple. But without of that, without that, there, there's no way, there's no level of, of secret pantry ingredients that we have. And that, that's the thing that we try to be as straightforward with as possible. We are chefs and we are scientists. We have no secret trove of Martian monk fruit that will fix everybody's problems. And so we try to say like, no, pick another thing. Like culinary creativity and choosing another route is three orders of magnitude cheaper than just bashing your head against the wall of like, we really need to make this without eggs. <laughs> make something else without eggs that's actually attainable without eggs. Um, the other thing is we just go, we go to a lot of trade shows. We talk to a lot of people and we do, um, we play like, uh, we're like uh, CIA profilers of uh, uh, food products. So when we go into a grocery store, I'll like look at all the protein bars and I'll be like, oh, that's weird. And also probably bullshit. And then we'll like do some Googling and figure it out. And sure enough, the thing that they're calling something something monk fruit is actually 99% erythritol with a soup on a monk fruit. Um, and, you know, I mean, we're not like going to whistleblow on anybody, but we are going to use that information to help us say, I don't care what you saw this small local Manhattan brand doing. They're not playing, like, they would get caught if they were at large national commercial scale. So, not everything is what it seems. Two more questions? So um, I'm with the Southern Food and Beverage Museum, and one of the things that we do is document all the food trends. And I would like your opinion of how niche some of the things that you're talking about are, as opposed to really big. I mean, I consider so eating soy like niche, and yes. I consider deciding everything that I'm gonna eat is only based on nutrition and not flavor niche. Yes. But it, do you think that those are just niche or are they overarching uh, trends? They are just, at this point, they are just niche. And that is that is very true. They're, I, I, this 97% of Americans probably don't have the luxury to make these decisions in the first place. Um, there is, uh, they are niche, but they are insidious. Um, they will sneak into every corner of food eventually. Um, what was happening in, in you know, food product development labs in the 50s um, started as like, look at this crazy food of the future. And it, it was treated a lot as like, you know, the world's fair. And it was like, can you believe we did this with, with slicing bread? Um, and then it became ubiquitous. And what's interesting is the, the, um, a lot of the ingredients that coastal, very privileged consumers have issue with are the ingredients that make the price range of most center aisle grocery store products achievable for the rest of the people in this country. And um, I, I do think that these conversations are niche, but that the, the answers to these conversations will affect everyone on, on the planet. And so you, you are absolutely right. Like these, these conversations at this point are, are very isolated and, and typically very moneyed. Um, they will have ripple effects that affect how everyone eats regardless of socioeconomic status or geography or preferences or anything. It will be a universal um, thing eventually. Yeah. Actually in response to, I just couldn't help but say, I'm a registered dietitian mm -hmm. and I'm actually a spokesperson for Soylent. So, <laughs> I couldn't just time. sit here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I, and yeah. say nothing. Um, just so you know, the messaging has changed. They're not about replacing food with one of their products, okay? They're about filling a food void, and I think that's something that we could all understand here in this room, that across the country, there's opportunities, unfortunately, I should say, lack of opportunities for certain people at certain times of the day to have a snack, or to have something that will give them nutrition, plant-based, 36 essential nutrients. So just saying before we just kind of sure. sit here and slam a company, we should really know a little bit more of what they're about. Of course, and uh, I absolutely thank you for filling that context in. Um, 
with all of this, again, I am not a registered dietitian. I'm not here to tell people what they should and shouldn't eat. I'm to, here to hopefully explain some of the wheels that turn behind the scenes that make some choices possible, um, and hopefully give people more tools to make to have have the opportunity to make choices. So, no, no shade at Soylent. Um, thank you guys so much. This was great. Sorry.